We're interviewing Arlene Elliott. Right. Formerly Arlene Schley. Yes. yes. Um, and uh, we're going to start at the beginning because I'm a fan of Brian Lamb who does the interviews on C-SPAN and, uh, uh, and he asks some very simple questions and uh, and uh, I think that's a good way to start. Where were you, when, and if you're willing to tell me, where were you born? <laughs> I was born, yes, in 1937 in Aberdeen, South Dakota. My parents uh, farmed at Stratford, and uh, there, uh, I was the last of five children, and just one of two was actually born in the hospital in Aberdeen. The others were born on the, on the home farm as was not uncommon, I understand, at that time, mm -hmm. and born into a Farmers Union family. Okay. And your family were originally from where? They uh, Everybody but the Native yeah. Americans came to South Dakota from somewhere. Where was your family um, from? from? From different parts of Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, my, uh, my The Schleis came over in um, around 1850, mm -hmm. and they were uh, originally from Pomerania in northern Germany. Mm hmm Okay. And you had you mentioned you had brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Two of each, all older. Okay, right? okay. Um, what do so you want to talk a little bit about your father? Oh sure. Dad was uh, a very very strong co-op farmers union uh, man. He um, he he served as. Um, state or county legislative committee man, which was a mm -hmm. role they had at that point in the county organizations, which meant he was uh, active at the state convention level, as mm -hmm. active as he could be, as uh, as economics would allow him the, uh, the opportunity to go to state conventions and so forth. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's an interesting little story there. When my oldest sister was married in um, 1945, I believe, or 46, uh, she and her husband took a honeymoon trip to the Black Hills, and Dad went along on their honeymoon because the Farmers Union Convention was in Rapid City at that time. So, uh, that uh, <laughs> has a little bit of, of flavor of his commitment to it. Uh, Dad, I was the youngest of the family, so um, Dad was born in 1892. Okay. And uh, so was the older generation. He talked about the farm holiday movement somewhat, but... Um, I don't believe he was ever active in it. You know, not mm -hmm. being a dairy farmer, he didn't do things like you know dumping milk and so forth, which is one of the things you hear about the farm holiday. Yeah. But um, but I think that uh, as far as Farmers Union was concerned, uh, he was. Uh, I I see that I pulled out of my memorabilia a 25 year member banner mm -hmm. uh, for my mom and dad, and that was at the 1962 convention. So you can see that that, that puts him back quite mm -hmm. a ways in terms of Farmers Union activity. Yeah, right the year you were born. Right, yeah. Um, I, don't, um, I don't know that Dad was ever on the board of any local cooperatives, mm -hmm. but uh, there's no way that he would have sold grain or bought gas from anything other than a Farmers Union Central Exchange affiliated co-op or a Farmers Union Grain Terminal Associated elevator. Mm -hmm. He was uh, totally and completely committed. Okay, what kind of a farm did you did? You uh, small have? grain. Small, small grain. grain. Uh huh. Um, at that point, it was mostly wheat, oats, mm -hmm. rye. Yeah. A um, little different than Brown County today, which is a lot of corn. Yes. And soybeans. Yes. And before before my uh, my brothers inherited the farm, of course, and then before they retired, they had begun to move in that direction with mm -hmm. some soybeans and corn and that sort of yeah. thing. But um, yeah. No, at that at that point back then it was. Uh, Mm -hmm. It was small grains. Okay. How about your mother? Well, mother was a native, oh, dad, I should say, was um, was actually born um, in Brown County. Mm -hmm. uh, mother was born in Harding County. Okay, way out uh, west. Yes, uh-huh. Um, and they met, um, dad had a brother who was farming out there, and mom was the hired girl for them. Mm -hmm. And um, Dad's brother's wife passed away in childbirth, and so when he went out for that funeral, he met Mom because she was working for them. Mm -hmm. And a few years later, they married, and Mom moved back to to uh, Stratford to the farm. Neither of them actually graduated from the eighth grade, which once again is not uncommon no. uh, for that. 
I think they both finished about fifth or sixth, but uh, mm -hmm. both were um, both were very articulate. Mm -hmm. Both had um, good command of the English language, wrote well. Dad was one of the people who frequently wrote letters to the editor of the Aberdeen paper, stating his political and his uh, cooperative beliefs. Yeah. Good, good, uh, good learning experience. You know, back before television, when we actually had had active family discussions at the at the dinner table, we we talked about world events and what was happening in the country. Okay. Uh, I guess that gets into a question of what are some of your earliest memories from the farm back then? These would probably almost be into the 1940s during World War II. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't. I can't know. Can't say specifically. I remember uh, uh, stamps, stamps, food rationing, mm -hmm. and getting stamps at school. Um, just, uh, just a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. Just a lot of hard work. With the, with the two older brothers, there was uh, there was not a lot of incidents of hired help at the farm. It was almost all totally a family farm. When I was uh, old enough to help at all, of course, we would, we would. Uh, um, do whatever it do whatever it took, but I I did very little field work until I was old enough to drive, and then I drove the truck mm -hmm. in the harvest field. But once again, with the two older brothers and dad, that pretty much took care of that. Mom was busy with uh, with cooking and gardening and raising chickens. Mm -hmm. I know we always had lots of chickens on the farm, and mom sold eggs. In fact, I think some of her egg money actually was my spending money in college. It was. Uh, Oh, and I remember the our mortgage burning ceremony when uh, when we oh. actually dad paid off the farm. Mm -hmm. He inherited it from his dad, but under heavy mortgage. So mm -hmm. those are some of the memories. I don't know that much about remember that much about actually um, field work or there there weren't. We had a few cattle. Mm -hmm. We milked milked mm -hmm. a few cows, but it was mostly for home consumption. Yeah. There was a, a remember a separator. Mm -hmm. um, a hand cranked. Separator separate the cream from the milk, and they. Uh, f we didn't get electricity on the farm until I was in the eighth grade, mm -hmm. and that was, of course, with their REA. And we didn't have a generator or a home unit, mm -hmm. so I went to bed at night carrying a get kerosene lamp up to my bedroom. And yeah, what year would that have been for electricity? Oh, uh, about fifty. Okay. Late forties, fifty, something like yeah. that. Nineteen fifty is the same year we got it on our okay. farm in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, but I was only three, so I can't oh. remember it. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, it was it was quite an event because I think many farmers did the same thing we did, and that was some home remodeling. Uh, we mm -hmm. put in an indoor bathroom for the mm -hmm. first time because you know you you dig the the well and you get the water and you put the electricity in and all those yeah. kinds of things go together. And so it was a modernization of the farm. It was a a great event when the REA came to the farm, as you remember that. Well, you don't remember it that well, but uh, it truly was. It truly I was. Don't, but uh, I, I, my parents certainly appreciated it. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. I'm sure everybody who did who would live most of their life to under with, without 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 it mm -hmm. without electricity. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember in Aberdeen, uh, the Equity Union Creameries was uh, mm -hmm. was a, a big event, and uh, I played piano from the time I was six years old or so. Okay. And so I would usually be part of the entertainment, either being on the program or else playing the piano for group singing or mm -hmm. for somebody else. And we so your uh, your family were selling cream to them. Or? Yes, and I think so you did also, have some dairy cows, uh, but I, not a lot, right? Right, right. It was, it, no, they weren't really dairy cows. They were. It was. Um, oh, okay. It was more just just a, a, a little bit of extra milk to sell, mm -hmm. other than what we mm -hmm. had. Mm -hmm. As I recall, also the Equity Union Creameries had uh, lockers, freezers, mm -hmm. so we kept our mm -hmm. meat there at uh, at their locker. Yeah, yeah. And I think there were uh, branch creameries or locally owned co-op creameries all over the state that probably were attached to probably, uh, probably. to the one here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you were, uh, well, you, you mentioned having these dinner table conversations. What, what were you talking about? What were the, some of the current events that, that were the topics of conversation? Um, 
This is the era before people started letting little kids go off to watch television right, while they were eating. Right. <laughs> uh, well, it, it was about farm programs, um, mm -hmm. uh, support for farmers. Um, uh, my father never had a kind word for Herbert Hoover, but he was very fond of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and of course that mm -hmm. was because of the farm legislation that was passed during that time. Well, as a matter of fact, it was because, and I, 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 I'm not remembering the name of the farm program, but it was one that, uh, that made it possible for him to, to pay off the mortgage and to stay in farming. Otherwise, he was mm -hmm. just nearly bankrupt. Yeah. Um, I do remember him telling once of, a, of a taking, um, I think taking maybe the cream or the egg, no, or maybe a load of wheat or something in to sell, and um, uh, after he paid off the necessary bills, he didn't have two dollars left to buy a new dress for mom, and mom wanted that, or it was material to make a dress or mm -hmm. something, and things were just that, that hard up, and so consequently when, when things started turning around, um, in 1937, I was born on county welfare, and he was able to pay that off after a while. And so things were really, really tough on the Schley farm, as I think they were on a lot of families. Mm -hmm. We didn't know we were poor because everybody was in the same shape. Mm -hmm. So you know, we we just kind of associated with uh, with the neighbors and yeah. Dad. Oh, I mean, the one thing about Dad also that was very I mentioned the music that 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 was part of my life. He was a barn dance fiddler. Oh, okay. Yes, so he, um, oh. and this was really before my time, um, and uh, mom never, uh, mom danced a great deal, I guess when they, before they met, but dad never danced, he played, and so she learned to play the piano, and they had a small piano they'd put on the back of the, the uh, uh, wagon, and take along to the neighborhood dances, and, and uh, he played, he played the violin up until just about the time he died, but that was part of our family uh, tradition also, was that music mm -hmm. center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, sort of traditional music probably. Oh yes, waltzes and polkas and you know, the, mm -hmm. the old time dance music, right. Mm -hmm. right. One, of, one of his favorites was Springtime in the Rockies. Okay. And we would, we would play that together many times. When you were uh, young, uh, when you started thinking about uh, what you might do in the future, what did you think about you might want to do? <laughs> well, for girls, there were three careers. It was uh, a nurse, a secretary, or a teacher. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I chose teaching. Yeah. And just that was just sort of the direction. Mm -hmm. And I taught for one year. Um, I taught music elementary music in Sioux Falls. I graduated from Northern in Aberdeen, of course. Yeah. It was close to home. I was the only one of the five of us who, who mm -hmm. finished college. My oldest sister, um, 14 years older than I am, um, did the six week or six month or something like that at Northern Normal yeah. to get the teaching degree. And then she continued to go back to school until I think she had a couple of years. But um, other than that, I was the only one who, who, who went through through college, but I um, I was going to be a music teacher until mm -hmm. I taught one year in Sioux Falls, and and it was not it was not really fulfilling to me. I was not real happy with it, and I think it was along about in March or so that uh, Al Johnson, his mm -hmm. name must have come up in your your interviews from Groton originally. He was mm -hmm. on the GTA a field man at that Al. point. Al talked to Dad, and then Al called me in Sioux Falls and at, said there was going, the, the education director for Farmers Union was, re, was leaving, was resigning, and would I be interested? Mm -hmm. And uh, to me it was just, you know, it was opening of a door that was just at the right time. Mm -hmm. Father was a little skeptical. He, um, obviously being totally committed to Farmers Union, was still sort of reeling from the McCarthy days, the Farmers Union being accused of being communist. Mm -hmm. And he did not want his daughter to have to face potential criticism and a lifetime of difficulty because of actually working for that organization. He was, it was that, you know, you hear about how it affected uh, mm -hmm. movie actors and all that sort yeah. of thing so severely. But it, it, it affected him that deeply. And we had lots of long talks about it until I finally, you know, uh, prevailed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I finished teaching in Sioux Falls one day and loaded my meager belongings into a car and drove to Huron and 
and uh, moved into a furnished apartment mm -hmm. and went to camp the next day. The camp. So next Friday, day. Saturday, and Sunday was the beginning okay, of the camp. Okay, this this would have been in nineteen. 59. 1959. Right. And right. where did you go to camp at? Yeah, it was, a, it was the state camp. The state camp. Okay, uh -huh. out of Placerville? Yeah. Right. Was that the mm -hmm. first one at Placerville? It was about then when they started having the camps there, I think. I think they'd been there a year or two before, but okay. they'd been somewhere in the Black Hills. Yeah. But um, I yeah. don't I don't know for sure. Uh, were, you, were you doing two camps at that time? Not at the beginning. Okay. Uh, I started the second camp. Mm -hmm. um, we did just one camp at Placerville for the first couple of years mm -hmm. that I was there. So it must have been in the early 60s that we started the second camp at Watertown with Timka. Um, District 3 had always been having, I say always, for several years had been having their, their uh, younger, uh, the reserve I think they were doing at that time, juniors mm -hmm. and reserves. We changed that to seniors and juniors during my tenure. Mm -hmm. uh, but the reserve camp had been a three-day camp at Wetimka at Watertown on Lake Compesca. And um, there were just a lot of, of, uh, of uh, teenagers, farm teenagers, I felt, who were not able to, to make that long a trip, whose parents mm -hmm. were reluctant. Uh, it was yep. an extra day away from home to travel that far. And so we thought that another camp closer to home. Mm -hmm. I was thinking primarily in terms of maybe the younger juniors could start at Watertown closer mm -hmm. to home, and then by the time they were juniors and seniors in high school, their parents would be more ready to let them go to the Black Hills. And it worked quite well. Uh, it was a much smaller camp at Watertown. We had mm -hmm. well over 100 uh, participants at the Placerville camp every year. Mm -hmm. We'd have, oh, 40 years ago, it's hard to remember. Um, probably somewhere between 35 and 60 or something like mm -hmm. that at Wotimka. I think we ran that for three three or four years and then decided it was not cost effective to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And was the, uh, were you operating this similar system as today with the district and county camps as well? Quite similar. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And right. Were, there, were there very many places that were doing local camps? Other than county? Uh, yeah. Because I know I, uh, no, I think county was the smallest. Yeah, unit Joan Hafner is still doing the, the St. John's local camp. Is she really? Yeah. yeah. Although she's she won't be this year. She no, did. she had a car accident. Yeah. I went yeah, to see her in the hospital, and yeah. uh, she really started her activity while I was was the education director. She's very near and dear to me, mm -hmm. and um, she has a daughter living out here at Stratford. Oh, okay. And yeah, uh, whenever I see right. her, she we we reminisce a little bit about you know the. She was just a little taught at the time we were doing mm -hmm. doing the camps, but mm -hmm. yeah, Joan Hafner and, and Joan Hafner had a wonderful family of, of yep. farmers union participation, and she was a real committed leader. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I think she was probably about the only one that that did that just on a day basis. But we had yep. uh, I, I was just looking through some old union farmers, kind of astounded at the number of county camps we had. We had. Uh, I think I, I just read something also that we had a couple thousand children from, uh, you know, from first graders probably up to high school seniors that participated mm -hmm. in our camp programs every summer. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were more people on the farms at those there days. Were. Yep. A lot more people on the farms that are, uh, and, and young people. So there there was a greater uh, number to mm -hmm. to come to come from the camps. Yeah. Yep. Sometimes I think that was almost the heyday. Mm -hmm. of Farmers Union was uh, yeah. those days. I think about the, you know, the, uh, well, this is perhaps something else you want to talk about, but the education funds that we got from Farmers Union Grain Terminal Association and, and the Central mm -hmm. Exchange, some people almost looked at it as a use of name fee. Yeah. But my recollection was that the by law they they could uh, contribute up to 10% of the earnings, I believe, to an education fund and our job every year was to convince them that the best education fund that they could have was the Farmers Union mm -hmm. and the Farmers Union Education yeah. Program. Yeah. And of course we incorporated them into our camp program. We had mm -hmm. representatives from... Mm -hmm. I, I was gone from the state for almost 30 years working for, uh, for 28 years or so working for the federal government. And I come back and I see everything Senex and, and uh, you know, whatever the new name is for yeah. GTA. Uh, and I have I have difficulty uh, you know uh, connecting with that yet, 
um, one one of my favorite farmers union stations was out at Union Center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Come out of Sturgis and come east and stop at Union Center at the Farmers Union Central Exchange and mm -hmm. co-op there and now you drive by and of course it's it's Senex and I know there was a lot of politics involved in all those changes and so forth but yeah. that's why I still say that the day when all those 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 co-ops were still named Farmers Union was sort of the heyday I think of uh, of, of that level of activity. Mm -hmm. Things have mm -hmm. changed. Yeah, yeah. You talked about the camps. What kind of things were you doing, for example, at the county camps in those days? Uh, what sort of education program? Uh, and then kind of work your way up to yeah. what happened at the state camp? Well, they were uh, they were all sort of thematically the same. Um, and of course, I wrote the uh, um, the camp study materials back then. There wasn't mm -hmm. anything coming from national or whatever. And I introduced things like United Nations studies. And uh, the, we did that as a major study topic at a, um, a camp, uh, a state camp. It would always be just a, a, a touch of that, you know, at the county camp. Always had, uh, uh, you know, a, a co-op store, of course, at the three-day to three day to, to seven-day ones. Yeah. And would talk about that sort of thing. I wasn't big on arts and crafts. Mm -hmm. I never have been. Fortunately, I had local leaders who were. Um, I don't know how many thousands of, of metal coat hangers in South Dakota have plastic lacing on them because this is Ruben <laughs> Glanzer from Parker mm -hmm. would braid this. Anytime mm -hmm. you'd see her at a meeting or at a camp, she'd be braiding this lace on coat hangers, making them you know thicker so that clothes would hang on them better, keep their shape better. And she thought, taught hundreds of, of young people how to do this. Uh, so I never spent time on arts and crafts. It was just not my bag. Mm -hmm. I spent time on performing arts with mm -hmm. the children, with teaching mm -hmm. them... Um, music? They did music. a lot of singing? Yes. Oh, lots and lots of singing. And we did lots of singing at state conventions and national mm -hmm. conventions. You know, I, I brag sometimes that I have sung from the stage of Carnegie Hall in New York City because there was a National Farmers Union convention at the Carnegie Hall in New York City. Really? And I was the national song leader for national conventions. Well, I'll be darned. I either, I either led the singing or or played the piano for someone else. Lorna Miller, my cohort from Wisconsin, would lead. Um, so that's, was, no, that's kind of fun. So yes, I put a lot of time into uh, skits mm -hmm. and uh, uh, performing kinds of things. Teaching young people to have confidence at a microphone and you know, performing in front of other people. Plus the the hardcore core guts of, of farmers union legislation and and co-op activity, and then United Nations, and then got very heavily into civil rights mm -hmm. uh, during that period. You know, the '60s was a hotbed of civil rights, and that was very very important. So um, we had a wonderful black woman, Jane Washington, who worked at National Farmers Union in the education department. Mm -hmm. We were always just thrilled when we could get Jane to come yeah, to South Yeah, she was Dakota. still there when I started. Okay, and come to our camps and so forth and and um, uh, let people, let, let South Dakota children, farm children, have an opportunity to associate with someone of, of a different race. Mm -hmm. And um, so those were, those were the, the topics. Always, obviously, foremost, Farmers Union, where it started and when it started, and uh, and then the co-op movement, and uh, and then United Nations and civil rights, and the performing part of it, music and uh, and you know music is the is the stalwart the stalwart of the labor union movement mm -hmm. for many years. I had the pleasure of singing on the stage with with Jim Patton and Walter Ruther uh, at the Sherman Hotel in Chicago singing. Uh, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, because the union makes us strong. Mm -hmm. You know, some really moving kinds of experiences yeah. that music can bring to the movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I like to think that I was a, a, a big part of that. Mm -hmm. So that was, that's, that's part of the, the recollections. Uh, I'm trying to 
find my way through my questions sure. because one of the things that happens in, in every interview is that you, <laughs> you, you uh, eliminate some of my questions along yeah. the way by addressing things that, that I had had questions for, but that's right. to be expected. I'd like um, to add two more things to yes. the music thing, if I might. Uh, along about in the early 60s, um, uh, there were uh, two record albums that came out. One was This Land Is Your Land. And with that song, and of course with all the accompanying music, and and uh, Lorna Miller and I introduced This Land Is Your Land to Farmers Union. And um, uh, the other one is just leaving my mind right now, but uh, what the other record album was Three Billion Millionaires. And it had songs associated with the three billion population in the world at that time. And so we based a lot of our programming, at, even at the all states level, at our state camp mm -hmm. level, on the music in those two record albums. One was, one was uh, This Land Is Your Land, talking about you know, the, uh, the whole association of, uh, of people, the, the Native Americans and the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the blacks and, and Caucasians. And then also the Three Billion Millionaires was part of the United Nations thrust. So we were kind of heavy. We were not uh, superficial. We were very heavy in terms of uh, of what we were trying to to bring into the lives of the young people. Mm -hmm. um, as a state education director, you had to deal with uh, a lot of volunteer, mostly farm wives, sure. I presume. There was yeah. occasionally a guy involved in the mm -hmm. education program, mm -hmm. but primarily it was the mm -hmm. farm wives. Uh, how was the process of, of finding people out there that would be willing to give some of their time in those days? Well, um... And usually people maybe who had kids that were into yeah. the thing too? I don't know that I actually ever uh, you didn't have to get a lot of them, huh? recruitment. I think that... They were there. Well, they came from, yeah, uh, the local or the, the county organization. And once they were named or identified, mm -hmm. yeah. then I moved to work with them, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to, to shore them up. Um, one specific example, when you talk about a man, was Lennis Larson. Mm -hmm. uh, Lennis is, I, he may be retired now from teaching in Spear Fisher, he may still be actively teaching. He's done many great things in his education career mm -hmm. also, but I went to a county meeting, district meeting, in District 1, one Saturday afternoon, and here were these twins, Lennis and Dennis, no, Lennis Larson first, I mean he has a twin brother, Dennis. He but does, let, I didn't yeah. know that. <laughs> uh, Lennis Larson uh, did a skit on Tiptoe Through the Tulips. <laughs> and if you remember, Tiny Tim was doing that at that time, and it was, was really popular. And he was just terrific. And I think he was a high school age at that point. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, do I need him? Where has this young man been? We need him in camps, and we need him in the youth program. So, uh, obviously, as soon as the, the meeting was over, I glommed on to him and talked for a while and then he said, I want you to meet my, my twin brother, Dennis. And I said, oh my gosh, you mean there's two of you? <laughs> but um, uh, Dennis was not of the performing bit and, mm -hmm. and that outgoing. He was more more um, uh, agricultural oriented yeah. and, and, and more interested in, in, uh, mm -hmm. in farming, but Lennis was, was very outgoing. And uh, I think that next summer I hired Lennis on our camp, summer camp staff. And he was with us in all the years that I was there, uh, which wasn't really all that fired long. And then for several years thereafter, and he became a district education director mm -hmm. then. And, and having a, a man in that position was really very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so he was, it was just, that was a great experience. But most of the others, uh, we had a leaders uh, bus trip that we would take to St. Paul to mm -hmm. go to the cooperatives. And we would have uh, training sessions with them. And of course, the, the seven district education directors were very key also. Mm -hmm. They were, they were the, um, you know, the backbone mm -hmm. of, of... Who were some of those uh, folks at that <sighs> Well, this Mrs. Uh, Ruben Glanzer from mm -hmm. Parker, um, Agnes Meyer from Chelsea, um, Grace Bubbers mm -hmm. from uh, Lemon, Morristown area, mm -hmm. uh, Babel Stormo from Watertown, 
your daughter wrote a column for the paper for a long time. Was that her daughter? Yeah. I wasn't real sure that it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I may be stumped at that. Mavis. Mavis, uh huh. Okay. Uh, Barb Heidenreich uh, came into uh, activity uh, as sort of Ag Agnes Meyer's uh, mm -hmm. assistant. Oh, um, oh, uh, McKenna, Carol McKenna mm -hmm. was on the state board, but she also worked as an education director, I think, for some time. Oh, it, um, I, get, I think I'm just about to come with all seven of them. Um, Moose. Um, this is Ernest Moose. Her first name eludes me right now from mm. uh, Madison. Okay. The Madison area. She was District 2, I believe. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mrs. Glanzer won Ernest Moose. Yeah. Oh, okay. They were all just really hard working and they would put together the camps in the area. Camps in, in the West River were, the county, the district camps were always a real challenge. Mm -hmm. um, we had. Uh, Oh, I think this was a county camp, Ruth Fairchild. Yes. Um, Hawken County, mm -hmm. Philip Faith. Yeah, her is daughter is on the state board right now. Oh, she is. Mm -hmm. Oh, for Marcia. Me's sake. Ah, okay. I really kind of lost track of what's mm -hmm. been happening lately. A um, couple of interesting experiences. It was a, it was I think an overnight camp at an old community hall schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. Uh, out I think the I know the place. <laughs> and one experience I had there, I just could not believe. It had one of these old roll-down screens on yeah. the stage. And when they rolled down that screen, it had all these little squares of advertising of all the local oh, businesses. Yeah, yeah. One of them said KKK number 11 or something like that. And I asked, what does that stand for? And they said, well, the Ku Klux Klan. And I said, in Western South Dakota, what was the Klan doing here? And of course, it was the anti-Catholic anti and anti-German feeling during the, the World War I also. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a... In, in, in a well, that went election. all the way up to North Dakota. They, My dad showed me where they burned crosses at, uh, not very far from the really? farm. Yeah. Well, I talked with my father about this one time, and he said... Uh, well, you know, we had a family picture of uh, Kaiser Wilhelm and his family during World War I. And he said, we had to hang that in a back closet and against the wall in case anybody ever came into our home who was, you know, uh, not sympathetic. And uh, uh, we would have been... And he, I said, well, what, what would have happened? He said, well, sometimes they'd throw a can of yellow paint on your house or something like that. I was mm -hmm. kind of kind of hard to believe, but, but I mm -hmm. guess that's true. Anyway, the other recollection I have I learned up there was that if we slept on our sleeping bags on the ground at night, which I don't think I did, I don't remember if anybody else did or not, but I wasn't that much of a of a camper. I like to have a bed. I sometimes would roll off my sleeping bag on a on a bed frame, you know, on springs. But mm -hmm. anyway, they said if you took a, a piece of rope and put it around, then the snakes wouldn't go over the rope and get into your sleeping bag. Yeah, I think they were pulling my leg on that one, but that's what they were telling me. Um, and then we had um, we had some overnight camps at uh, Frank Butler's farm near mm -hmm. Bison, mm -hmm. and that was when Grace Bubbers and Frank and, and his wife Stella were uh, very, very supportive, and I'm sure Frank that... Frank was still on the board when I oh, started. Oh, he was. Yeah. Boy, he was well, killed the next year. Oh, uh, yeah. He and Stella both... Yeah. Oh, no, and Stella was not. His brother um, his brother and his wife were killed yeah. in that plane accident. Yeah, Stella but, lived until just, uh, just three, recently, four or five right, years ago. Right. One right. of her daughters um, and her husband have a combine crew. And they come by, come through, and they, they do some combining at near Columbia. And she came over to see me about a year ago. Okay. Yeah, right. Just tremendous family, tremendous friendships that uh, that last a long time. Mm -hmm. While I think about that, one of one of my uh, my philosophies also came from James Patton. He uh, mm -hmm. made a statement that farmers union is a philosophical hitching post. And I don't know how many times I use that in training and in in uh, camps and in speeches and so forth, because for me that was very true. Mm -hmm. Of course, it started when I was just a wee child with my father teaching yeah. me, but Farmers Union was a philosophical hitching post. It was right, in my opinion, on civil rights, right on United Nations, right on co-ops, mm -hmm. right on Farmers Union, yep. just and, and, yep. and brotherhood of, of, of man and women, mm -hmm. just um, everything that I believe in. 
Mm -hmm. It's anchored in Farmer's Union. It's a philosophical hitching I've course. I've heard that's that before. Very, very yeah. positive, very, very profound. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I think everybody needs to, you know, have have something that that probably at some point in their life, you know, sometimes for some people it changes. Some mm -hmm. people can come from a, a, a a progressive background and go the other way yeah. and uh, pit like to the dark side the new Star Wars is coming out here You're right right and other people do the other do mm -hmm. the opposite uh, mm -hmm. uh, let me uh, scan my question sure here. how are the young people to deal with then you know uh, how receptive were they uh, you, you you talked about some of the leaders how about some of the young people that were in the program were they uh, uh, enthusiastic. Uh, I would guess that some of those kids were, uh, while they may have gotten television out at the farm, that uh, the modern media, I think, is probably, and I don't know whether you would agree or not, has, has had an impact on how kids are today as opposed to the way they may were may have been, um, you know, 40 some years ago. They were like vessels just open to drink it in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and I guess, you know, maybe nostalgia uh, and, and looking back makes you remember the, the good things. But mm -hmm. um, I don't know that that I would be uh, very effective in working uh, with the same group of, of, of young people today as I mm -hmm. was then. Of course, I was younger then. I was in yeah. my 20s and I was closer to them yeah. so that uh, uh, our backgrounds and our influences were similar. Mm -hmm. And so I could relate probably a lot better then. We had very few discipline problems. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the biggest discipline problem we might have would be uh, some, some teenage boys trying to sneak out after lights out at night, you know, mm -hmm. just to go down to the stream or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but no, they were, they were there for sessions, they were there for KP duty, never complain more than just the normal little, you know, grousing that you would do mm -hmm. on stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, willing to participate in, in uh, all sorts of activities. No, I, I, I felt that they were, they were, they were well-disciplined, well-raised farm, farm kids, um, mm -hmm. volunteer. Now, there was also the, uh, the continuing education program. You want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, the, you know, the, the, they would go to camp in the summertime, but then there was also the oh, yeah. classes that they would do Absolutely. throughout the year uh, that they was very much involved with, if, for example, the Torchbearer program. Mm -hmm. That material um, was nationally generated, and I'm not sure whether it still is today or not, but there were, there were study books um, that came out every year, um, mm -hmm. and, and the, um, um, the ones for the for the um, the teenagers, what were called juniors then, which are senior, well, we changed to seniors, yeah. uh, were um, were books essentially. And I came up up with a couple of them the other day. Um, they were paperback type books, and maybe a mm -hmm. uh, hundred pages long or something like that. But they were written by people like Glenn Talbot, uh, who was uh, national vice president, or they were written by by people who. Um, were involved in the co-op movement, mm -hmm. and they were they were um, his substantial. sister was involved in the education Gladys program. Gladys Talbot Edwards, yeah, yeah well, really one of the one of the very uh, early early ones. I was she already no uh, she retired, was or yeah, was she, she was still, retired she yeah. was retired. I would see her at conventions and so forth, mm -hmm. but but she was not active. Flossie Nickel yeah was the education director. John Eckland was really the education director for several mm -hmm. years, and Flossie Nickel was the youth director. But that's when Farmers Union took on a, uh, a much broader view of education. For instance, John Eklund was the one who, who developed the Latin American project, which I hope we can talk about a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And then Flossie was primarily involved with the, with the youth program. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would, they, and of course, the state directors of education were all part of the, the council that would meet with Flossie and make decisions on what kinds of things we would study mm -hmm. the next year and what we would work with. Um, yeah. Oh, a couple of memories that I that I really would like to share. Uh, one was a state director's meeting in uh, Montana. Montana had a a state campsite, mm -hmm. and it was a beautiful big old log cabin lodge 
with uh, housing for for um, uh, many of the campers in the lodge, and then I think a couple of other uh, cabins. I think they still have that out there. Well, they may have a different one well, because well, the last possible. day okay. that we were checking out, that we we already had all of our suitcases packed, uh -huh. and somebody was going to be driving us into Great Falls to the airport. It started burning. And oh. it burned down. There was no way to stop it. You know, like I said, <laughs> fortunately, we all had our suitcases packed, so we didn't lose any personal belongings. But Montana mm -hmm. lost this incredibly one. It was old enough, so the mm -hmm. log was logs were very dry. Oh, and yeah. by the time the fire department got there, it was out of control. We tried to get some water and throw mm -hmm. it on and so forth. Well, of course, that same thing happened to the original Mayflower Hall out at Placer. Yes, it, burned it did. Back right. in the 70s. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another interesting experience in terms of civil rights goes back to Flossie and this uh, and Jane Washington. Uh, we were meeting in Oklahoma City, and someone had arranged for um, us to have dinner one night in a private club mm -hmm. on the top of a of a of a skyscraper, as much as maybe twenty stories high in Oklahoma <laughs> uh -huh. City at that time. I don't uh -huh. know. And we got up there, and uh, uh, Flossie said, you know, uh, reservations for 12 or whatever it is for the uh, Farmers Union Education Group. And we stood around, and we stood around, and we weren't seated. So Flossie went to the Mater D and said, uh, you know, we've been here for quite a while, and we had reservations. Um, is there a reason we're not being seated? And he said, well, yes. He said, there's a member of your party. He said... Um, uh, over there, and he was looking at Jane Washington, and he said, of course, we weren't using the term black then yet, is she mm -hmm. Negro? <laughs> and Flossie said, uh, well, I don't know. I think maybe she's Native American. Because in Oklahoma, at that time, the, no. the Native American tribes had money from the, their oil resources and so forth, and, and were more respected than they were here at that time. And, uh, and and probably could have been allowed entry. And he said, uh, "Would she say that she's Native American?" And Flossie said, "No, I think she'd say that she's uh, she's Negro." Mm -hmm. And so he said, "Well, I'm sorry. I'm afraid we can't seat your party uh, uh. unless she were to leave." And so we all just walked back over the elevators and went down and went to a little restaurant down the hall. But you know, some in some interesting experiences like that with Farmers Union. Yeah. They sort of, uh, they, they sort they stay with you, you know, you, mm -hmm. uh, you don't ever forget that kind of shunning no. that happens and no. just really uh, deepens your commitment to the cause. No. Yeah. You know, today, it, you know, I, we know that we have still plenty of problems in the country, but it seems uh, like almost unbelievable that, that, it, that as, as short a time ago yeah. as that, that, right. that, that kind of thing was, right. was prevalent, not just occasional, but it happened all the time. Within, within my lifetime, yeah. I, yeah. I personally experienced it at, at probably age 25 or something like that. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, I had a couple of questions here that you just dealt with one of those. I, I was going to ask you about the kind of issues you were dealing with, and uh, boy, that's one of them for sure. Right. And you just gave me, I said, was going to ask for some stories, and you just <laughs> gave me one of those. So, so yeah. Um, another, another thing uh, in terms of what we dealt with was, um, and I, I am a little bit uh, uncertain of some of the specifics, but reapportionment of uh, of uh, oh yeah the one uh, man one vote the, question yeah, one person one vote yes <laughs> so I'm sorry <laughs> I, my memories are from the early sixties when that was I, the debate that's right. thing, and know? I kept I kept trying to change it to one person one vote yeah. but I was fighting a losing cause back then a yeah. uh, farmers union nationally uh, uh, supported that as the right thing to do mm -hmm. and of right. course what it meant for South Dakota is that we lost a congressperson. You know, mm -hmm. we went from two to one representative in South Dakota. Pretty hard to sell to to farm people. Mm -hmm. And I took it upon myself in the education role, and with certainly Ben Radcliffe's complete blessings, that as I was invited to, to speak at county and district meetings during that whole period, I made a significant part of my speech devoted to mm -hmm. the, the correctness yeah. Of of the one person one vote, and while while it might mean some uh, uh, some loss of representation to us as we would 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 explain it, uh, we had 
brothers and sisters in the labor union movement and uh, throughout the country in metropolitan areas mm -hmm. who, who were really entitled to an equal representation yeah. type of thing. So reapportionment came, became a, a real issue that, uh, yeah. that, that we worked on and, and probably uh, helps to explain how I interpreted my role as being more than, being, no, I shouldn't say more than in terms of it being more important, but being broader mm -hmm. than, than just mm -hmm. the youth education role. Sure. I, I was very much involved in the, the adult education role also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that most people with regard to reapportionment today uh, wouldn't, uh, it would be pretty hard to find somebody who would complain about the fact that uh, the districts, legislative and congressional districts mm -hmm. have to have something approaching the same number of people right. in each one. Right. Uh, but we still have the Electoral College, and we right. know how that can... Well, and of course, especially the, it, it, the, the Senate side takes care of the, uh, the representation of, of uh, you know... The, the states, the, the yes. States, right. Mm -hmm. and, and then the House of Representatives is, is mm -hmm. apportioned differently. So. Yeah. But it was a real learning experience and a, a hard sell. I got some hard questions, and mm -hmm. why in the world is Farmers Union um, not supporting what would appear to be the the rights of farmers to have you know this and, and more sparsely yeah. populated areas but we worked it through mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. and that was probably we lost a bunch of the farm block at that time because uh, those so. rural folks yeah. were farm oriented uh, mm -hmm. maybe not the, exactly the way we'd want them to be but uh, mm -hmm. pretty much so yeah it was one of the one of the areas like I said uh, it, it was the right thing to do mm -hmm. and it certainly was uh, 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 participating and yeah. working with our, our, our labor union mm -hmm. partners. To, mm -hmm. uh, to Could be that. seen probably as in the same category as perhaps uh, uh, through the civil rights movement, the whites giving up a bit of their uh, pre preferred position in the South, even though they didn't, they, mm -hmm. they fought it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, it was the right thing to do. We had uh, farmer labor conferences on an annual basis mm -hmm. also, and um, in, in, in having those conferences, which were attended by both labor union members and farmers union members, mm -hmm. that was one of the issues that, that you know, that we could, we could certainly uh, work together on and, and mm -hmm. seek uh, their support on other issues because okay. we were supporting them on that. Now, was there a lot of discussion of the tax issue, which is, of course, periodically comes up in South Dakota? Was that coming up a lot the, in the, the 1960s? Tax, mean, well, the co-op tax is one thing, certainly. Okay. That's that's a potential mm -hmm. issue. You want to talk about that a little well, bit? Well, I would talk about that only in light of the fact that, uh, not only in light of, but primarily in light of the fact that I uh, serve on the board of directors right now for the Aberdeen Federal Credit Union. Mm -hmm. And uh, we battle that all the time. Mm -hmm. um, when we were in, I was in Washington in, in February at the uh, Government Affairs Conference. And uh, it's it's always on the back burner. Sometimes it's on the front burner. Mm -hmm. But uh, right now there's uh, uh, there's hearings scheduled. I think, or they're talked about anyway, from uh, uh, Congressman Thomas from uh, California. The whole issue of taxing of nonprofits and of, of cooperatives. Mm -hmm. and it just seems to me that uh, that if they uh, make any headway in terms of uh, trying to tax the earnings. Of credit unions, that the whole co-op yeah. movement is is uh, vulnerable. You know, it's just one of those cutting away kinds of things. And so, I would uh, I would hope that the entire co-op movement, and I think they are, you know, uh, in 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 sync with this and mm -hmm. supporting the credit union mm -hmm. uh, battle on it. But uh, yeah, the the taxation thing is. A, well, this is the same guy who's going to bring up the uh, social security. Uh, I think so. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Somebody He's that uh, be the uh, guy to get Bush's stuff out mm -hmm, on the table. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, they just uh, of course credit unions are are um, uh, are growing. We are very. I've been on the board since I've been, I've been back in South Dakota now for ten years uh, for mm -hmm. my government career, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been on the board for I think eight years, and we've grown from a twenty million to a fifty-two million dollar credit union mm -hmm. in assets in that amount of time, and of course that is. Primarily because of the service and because of the people oriented and sure. the uh, the whole credit union, yeah. whole co op, mm -hmm. you know, influence. And many people involved in credit unions don't know much about co ops. And so I continue to be a, <laughs> a trainer, mm -hmm. so to speak, in terms of, of what this means in terms of the whole co op movement, encouraging them to work more closely with the uh, South Dakota Association of Co op cooperatives and so forth. That, uh, mm -hmm. Well, you might encourage. Uh, um, 
I haven't gotten him to a meeting yet, but Leon Swenson is uh, on the, the advisory committee for this project. Oh, sure. Project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Oh, and I, I think I talked with him specifically about, about looking into the association with the South Dakota Association of Cooperatives, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you never, you never lose your co-op uh, uh, feelings, mm -hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you're in town, that's one of the co-ops that you can be active right. in, even mm -hmm. even though we don't necessarily have co-op stores around here, but uh, in some parts of the country they do. I know Lee Swenson uh, was trying to hire me out in California, where oh, he's really? at, and uh -huh. uh, he took me to a co-op supermarket in uh -huh. Davis, California, uh -huh. which is where the uh -huh. Ag College is at. I see. You know, just like sure. a supermarket here, except it's a co-op. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's kind of nice. Yeah, I, I don't right. know if I got a picture of that or not. But, uh, <laughs> they're pretty. They're they're pretty big out there. Okay. Um, let's see. You uh, you talked a little bit about the the commitment of education funds back in those days. Um, most of the local co-ops donated education funds to the program. Those are kind of split between the counties at that time and the. And the state organization. Uh, you know, I uh, I'm not as familiar with what the local co-ops did as what the regionals as did. what the regionals yeah. did, and those were big chunks of money. I can get some more coffee. Sure. Uh, those were big chunks of money, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that was what really kept the uh, kept the education department uh, going. And uh, mm -hmm. it was it was, and of course, that's obviously the reason now that. That the uh, foundation is so important because yeah. there, there is, as I understand anyway, not that commitment of uh, of education funds from those regional cooperatives. Well, yeah, uh, there, there, there is and there isn't uh, for, from uh, from the regional. Of course, the two, what were the two regionals are now one. Yes, yes. And uh -huh. uh, we this year we're. Probably doing something over a hundred thousand dollars from them. Oh, so, that's what that's. Perfect. So they, yeah. it's the bulk of the money yeah. that goes for the the, mm -hmm. the camp program Good. and the youth program. Good. Good. Uh, we have four summer staffers that are signed mm -hmm. on for this year. They're interns. They're getting an intern title this year so that they can get college credit. For oh, that's wonderful. Spending the summer doing yeah. this kind of thing. Good. So they're uh, they'll be hitting the road for their first camp next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I have to kind of juggle my schedule to so I can get a car to go out and do mm -hmm. interviews. <laughs> um, let's see here. Okay, now comes the point of uh, I was going to ask you about internationalism, and this is oh, probably yeah. the point where you can you can. Uh, Jump off and start talking about what you uh, what you brought up before. Well, about one, the, one the of the program. one of the really exciting things that that happened to me during my my tenure there was the opportunity to be in on the ground floor of the Latin American project. Uh, Dr. John, oh, I guess going back one step even further, uh, during the Kennedy administration, mm -hmm. uh, there was a program called the Alliance for Progress yeah, with the that. with the uh, reaching out to Latin America to to um, further our, our uh, associations and our assistance and mm -hmm. our help to Latin America. And John Eklund, who was the National Director of Education, worked with the Agency for International Development, AID, within the State Department to develop a grant program for Farmers Union mm -hmm. to uh, assist uh, Latin American campesinos, we call them, peasant farmers, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. in learning how to to develop cooperative uh, ways of business to assist them in their, their activity. Yeah. This could be as simple as, as a, um, a half dozen or a dozen or as many as they needed uh, farmers getting together to buy a truck mm -hmm. to haul their produce to market. I mean, they were simple things because mm -hmm. this was out in the hinterlands of, the, uh, of, of the, some of the Latin American countries. And uh, it was really interesting. I was at a national meeting and uh, was talking with John Eklund, and he was telling me about some of the people he'd recruited. He was getting, mm -hmm. I think, five or six people. And um, he had one terrific uh, uh, co-op manager from Mankato, Minnesota, Arnold Ackerman, would be on the team. But then he had some other people that I didn't think had any real Farmers Union background and co-op background. So I was, in, as, as I am likely to do, uh, I, I speak my mind, 
And I said, John, you need to recruit some more farmers union and co-op people for that team. I mean, mm -hmm. some of these people may speak Spanish, which is helpful, but if, they, if their heart isn't you know, completely in the right yeah. place, he said, well, how would you like to go? And I said, me, go to South America? <laughs> and it was just like that. He went across the room and he talked to Ben Radcliffe, mm -hmm. my boss at that time, to see if I could get away for a couple months. And Ben said, it's up to her if she thinks she can handle it. Mm -hmm. So before the night was over, I was signed up as a team, and it was it was it was just sort of a whirlwind from that point on. It was a wonderful experience. Um, we divided into two teams, and there were three of us. Went to um, Venezuela, Peru, and Chile. Mm -hmm. uh, the other team went to Colombia, and I'm not sure what other country. But um, uh, and and the thing that 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 really added a lecture excitement to the whole thing besides my first south american trip and all um, first international trip never been out of the country mm -hmm. before um was that we flew over cuba in october of 1962. Ooh. the day before, <laughs> oh, yeah. like the day before the blockade ah. and uh, i like you know I, I say we were among the one of the last planes that flew over cuba because one of the things that happened with the blockade was that mm -hmm. all air traffic was stopped sure. over cuba Sure. And so we landed in, in, in Caracas, Venezuela, and um, uh, we were supposed to, we were working with the local AID people there and the local mm -hmm. agricultural ministry, we're supposed to, you know, like head out into the, the country, mm -hmm. the Could, interior. Yeah, can I ask you a quick yes. question sure. that kind of interrupts yeah. that a little bit? What did you hear about the Cuban Missile Crisis? You were off in South America while it's happening. Uh, did you hear about it the way we did? Uh, at at first, I thought we didn't hear a lot, but we mm -hmm. were working with the uh, uh, with the United States representatives there yeah. in, in Agency yeah. for International Development, mm -hmm. and so they were able to share, you know, um, yeah. some things that that were happening. Uh, so what, what, it, it impacted us immediately because we were supposed to just get a day or two orientation and mm -hmm. then head out into the interior, oh. and they kept us in Caracas for a, a week. Oh, okay. They were afraid. That yep. you know that it might be more dangerous for yeah. us because there were a lot of of Castro sympathizers. Well, hadn't they thrown like thrown stones or something at Nixon down there not too long ago before the beginning of the Kennedy administration? He had been off trying to. I think so. Do a yeah a tour or something. Yeah. I thought in Caracas um, that may have happened. You know. Right. Um, we didn't we didn't feel any antagonism against yeah. us because we were yeah. Norte Americanas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as much as the fact that that the people in that many people in Venezuela mm -hmm. were were Castro supporters. Yeah. And so um, there was a um, there was uprisings. There mm -hmm. were uprisings. Mm -hmm. And um, actually when they sent us out and let us go into the interiors because they felt we were safer there than in Caracas, we would hear we would hear bombings almost every night from our hotel room windows oh, wow. that, uh, you know, there really was a lot of activity going yeah. on. Anyway, uh, our mission was very important. Uh, the mission, as I said, was to, to help to teach people how to develop local cooperatives mm -hmm. and to identify uh, young Latin American farmers, I say young, not necessarily mm -hmm. Latin American yeah. farmers, who would then come to the United States and live mm. on farms. Okay. Uh, for I think it was like maybe six weeks period mm -hmm. of time to learn and learn uh, the co-op ways and so yeah. it was a dual function it was also going out and recruiting farm families who were willing to take these mm -hmm. young people into their homes yeah. and onto their farms and with the direction that they're going to learn our farming methods, but that's not the primary reason why they're there they're supposed to go to your co-op meetings with you mm -hmm. and and learn about that well, of course, many of them were, were essentially uneducated or yeah. minimal schooling and certainly no English language capacity. Yeah. So um, uh, there was a contract made with Jamestown College to bring them all there for, I think, a month mm -hmm. with an intense English language training. Okay. So that when they got onto the farms, they could at least have some verbal communication. Mm -hmm. It just you know, many, many. We brought like sixty or seventy over every year for about four years, and they were primarily placed on farms in North and South Dakota, mm -hmm. Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Okay. In this Midwest area, and it was it was just truly an incredible experience. That their, uh, uh, you know, most of them came from local areas where they didn't even have running water or electricity yeah. or everything, and they would come into a, a modern farm home, you know, mm -hmm. and um, 
just the 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 relationships between the the campesinos and and their farm fa farm uh, host families. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some problems, as there are bound to be in that mm -hmm. sort of a case. Um, one of the problems I think it was was interesting, and just in terms of mores, and that's that that uh, uh, drinking alcoholic beverages was very common, you know, with the with these young campesinas. Mm -hmm. And or I say young; I should quit using that term. They were campesinas, yeah. uh, and and many of the farm families that was just not a regular practice. And so, if they were mm -hmm. if there were two or three in in a community, I remember one time they. <laughs> They were sitting in the middle. Somebody had given them a bottle of wine in some small town somewhere in southeastern South Dakota. They were sitting in the middle of the street about midnight one Saturday night, oh. <laughs> and then the police were were talking with them. So there were some incidents like that, but that you know, that was just one of the things. It's just all the cultural mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But the uh, uh, just the wonderful relationships. Yeah. Did, did they run into any problems anywhere? Because I know that. Uh, when I was a kid in North Dakota, of course, we were on the edge of the Red River Valley, and uh, we did get a lot of, uh, of, of migrant workers mm -hmm. who were primarily mm -hmm. Mexicans, mm -hmm. and uh, there was certainly a prejudice against yes. them uh, up there. Did they? Did any of your people they, run into that? They in may have. Areas? They may have, but I think that was lessened because they were in the company of their host family. Mm -hmm. They okay. couldn't go any place really without yeah. being in the car. Yeah. with their host family. They didn't have driver's licenses. Yeah. They were usually too far to, you know, to walk mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And the host families, I'm sure, buffered that. Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And if anything, in a, uh, in a community, maybe they helped to, to further the cause of the relationships. Although, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, they weren't Mexican. Yeah. Just like, you know, some of our prejudices are, are mm -hmm. very narrow. Yes. And so, oh, you know, these are, these are from Mm -hmm. Venezuela, or, yeah. or this, this gentleman is from Peru, or something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but I would yeah. think that that might have uh, might have helped. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know of uh, of a lot of follow up. I'm not sure that we were able to really track these uh, farmers mm -hmm. as they went back. Yeah, that was going to be my, uh, my question. Is uh, there was um, uh, there was there was uh, a story I heard one time about a, a woman who came from Peru. Mm -hmm. And how effective she had been mm -hmm. in her home community when she okay. went back, but that's about the only one I mm -hmm. think that I ever had any. You know, if there were any additional programs, you know, I I've been involved with uh, with VOCA, uh, Volunteers for Overseas Cooperative Assistance, mm -hmm. and then uh, they kind of merged with ACDI, which John Eklund mm -hmm. headed mm -hmm. when I started work for mm -hmm. Farmers Union. Yeah. Uh, but they were primarily programs sending people overseas. I don't know that there mm -hmm. was that much of an emphasis there to bring people over here to expose them to anything. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I would hope that that when uh, ACDI uh, mm -hmm. people did go mm -hmm. overseas, that maybe they went into some of the communities and, and looked up mm -hmm. some of the people that had been here and been trained yeah. so that they would be helpful. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't have that kind of connection. Mm -hmm. Don't how uh, how was your experience? Do you, you got actually got on the villages oh, down yes. there and uh, yes. uh, dealt with <laughs> la lack of running water, which oh, you yes. probably remembered from your own farm. Right. Uh, we maybe. we were fortunate in that we were always we always stayed in a hotel oh, where okay. we had uh, modern facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't always you know like the most up to date, yeah. but we were. We would we would go into we were tra we traveled in a Vene I was in Venezuela for like six weeks of that time, and then only like a week and a half in Peru and a week and mm -hmm. a half in Chile. So it was my experiences were mostly in Venezuela. We traveled in a um, uh, a van, uh, a Mercedes Benz autobus as they called it, Ooh, okay. with a Venezuelan driver mm -hmm. and uh, and a Venezuelan interpreter with us, and. Um, uh, we would go out into a community where they would have, they would have a feed for us, and uh, uh, you know, some they they they'd cook some meat over an open fire and that sort of thing. Mm, and so, mm -hmm. you know, we were always just a little, a little gleary of the yeah, kind of food you're eating. Down one there. time, one time, Arnold came up to me and he said, "Don't don't look too surprised." And he was talking very quietly. I knew they wouldn't understand us, but he said. Uh, what what do you think this is in this this chunk of meat that I'm eating? And I said, well, looks like it might have been a worm to me. And he said, well, what do you think I ought to do with it? And I said, well, I it's obviously dead. It's been pretty hot. I'd eat around it and then throw it away. You know. 
but uh, that was that was just one one occasion. Yeah. We had we were treated just royally, and uh, but late. Sometimes a meeting would be scheduled at seven o'clock in the evening, and it wouldn't start until ten o'clock. Mm. Because mm -hmm. we talked about the Latin American time yeah. schedule, and they were probably dealing with what kerosene lamps. Oh there, yeah. yeah, so yeah. you were kind of yeah. plunged back yeah. into the past. Absolutely uh, right, and uh, um, no, I, I think there were sometimes light bulbs hung, you know, just, mm -hmm. just oh, okay. hung from the ceiling. I don't know that we had that, mm -hmm. but um, uh, many times we were because of the the, the Cuban situation. Uh, we were stopped on the highway, mm -hmm. and our vehicle was searched. Okay. Uh, and there were just, in the middle of the night, you know, we'd be going back from a meeting, and I remember one time specifically, some armed, uniformed guys jumped out from the ditches and stopped the, 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 the van. And it was pretty frightening, because, you know, mm. you weren't sure they were, they apparently were, were the, the 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 guard I mean I mean our guide our driver and our, our interpreter were official government employees so they were able to show their identification and get us through we never got personally searched mm -hmm. I mean we were able to talk they were able to talk our way through but it was a pretty frightening situation yeah. at times yeah yeah were there any Peace Corps people down there yet oh yeah um, we ran into a couple of them time to time they were not actually working with us but. Uh, yeah, that was that was an association. One time in one village, uh, um, I was uh, in the fellow making the introductions and so forth, who was a local leader, uh, introduced me as uh, as Jackie, because they knew about the Kennedys, and I was probably the, <laughs> I was probably okay. the first North American woman they had ever seen, mm -hmm. and so uh, I, it was interesting. It was quite an experience, but anyway, I think it was an. In, incredibly valuable experience mm -hmm. for our farm families here to have yeah. the opportunity to work with mm -hmm. you know um, uh, someone from another culture another country and to share their their life and their experiences with them as well as the learning experience that went on to go back there mm -hmm. to promote a cooperative way of, of doing business yeah and you probably did a lot of public speaking oh, kind yes. of sharing your experiences yes. once you got back from down there right. and the program was ongoing mm -hmm. up here mm -hmm. yes i just went down the one year mm -hmm. and then we had i'm sure it was four or five years worth of uh of uh, programming that mm -hmm. that continued here. Okay. Now there was also a program. I think that was kind of was this the like the farm trainee program? I think. Uh, yeah. I've heard that term have. trainee. I've mm -hmm. heard that term applied. Mm -hmm. And then I've I've heard also that there was kind of a not so much uh, as a training program maybe or but a cross cultural program of bringing people from Europe over here. Who spent some time with families? Because I, I I know people who still have connections with people over there that that's been over here for a while. Probably not the same sort of a learning program because obviously the Germans, for example, or yeah. the French were mm -hmm. were much ahead of the mm -hmm. of the Venezuelans. I I I think that some of that happened even before I went okay to work into the fifties maybe. Yes, um, I I remember hearing my 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 counterpart in Wisconsin, Lorna Miller, talking about um, some of the folk dances that she, because this was something that was a big thing for mm -hmm. her, that she had uh, uh, some exchange uh, uh, fellow from France mm -hmm. so forth come to the state camps and teach some of the young people the, uh, uh, the folk dancing that mm -hmm. they did in their country. Do you think maybe there's a need for a little of that again? Because mm -hmm. it seems to me like sometimes even though we want to be out all over the world, we also are very insular, and we resent everybody overseas, and uh, we're uh, we're we're almost xenophobic sometimes. Oh, and we we think everybody ought to speak English because we do. We haven't, and most people around the world are making efforts to to learn more than one language, and we just mm -hmm. our schools still are not doing that, and so forth. Oh yes, mm -hmm. I think I think any exchange that we can do it has got has got value. I really do. Yeah. Um, you know, there the height. A lot of schools do mm -hmm. do the exchanges, mm -hmm. which I just think are wonderful. Yeah, and I'm assuming wonderful. that like like the Peace Corps, there was a lot of idealism involved with oh, this. Yes. Uh, oh yes. Oh yes. That uh, you know, I'm I'm from the same gen or the generation at least that got inspired by mm -hmm. that. I was still mm -hmm. in school, but mm -hmm. you know. Matter of fact, for part of my government career, I spent about six months detailed to uh, the home offices of the Peace Corps in Washington, and was able to enhance my 
appreciation for mm-hmm. the, the real commitment and idealism of yeah. the people who participated. Yeah. Do, you, do you kind of feel like maybe that uh, uh, that, 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 that effort to kind of promote cooperatives in those places, that that kind of stuck, uh, that, that maybe those folks are doing a bit of that anyhow? I would like to believe they are. Yeah. It just would seem to me that that would have such a profound influence on mm-hmm. their life and would set them apart yeah. from their, uh, set them, you mm-hmm. know, a, apart in a leadership role yeah. in their communities. They were they were recognized as community leaders as we identified them to come over. Mm-hmm. And so this would just enhance their role so that when they would go back, I, I just can't help but, but think it would it would be an underlying kind mm-hmm. of, uh, if it was not overt in terms of actually yeah. being able to set up a co-op, that it would certainly mm-hmm. be an underlying influence in everything they did in their community. Yeah. What kind of governments did these places have in those days? There was not the kind of democracy that exists in South America today. Weren't, uh, were a lot of these... Uh, um, variants of some other, maybe more authoritarian type of regimes? I I think that would be speaking beyond my memory okay. or my knowledge at this point. Okay. I don't uh, I don't I don't have any specific recollection. It seems to me that that we were not necessarily dealing with a dictatorship. Mm-hmm. That um, okay. there was someone in that Venezuelan government anyway who was uh, uh, willing to interact with yeah. the United States yeah. enough to mm-hmm. to. Um, um, now you were in Venezuela. Do you go anywhere else? Peru your, and Peru? Chile. Okay. Peru did you get into the Andes in Peru or? I did. Yeah, a little bit. A yeah. little. Di- I did not get up to um, <laughs> Machu Picchu. Yeah, right. Yeah. I did not. I did not do that. Um, uh, but I, we did. We were only there. I got into a, a couple of Indian burial sites that were rather interesting. When mm-hmm. we arrived in Peru, there had been a plane crash. The uh, the day before that had killed the Minister of Agriculture. Oh. And um, um, so that really put a kibosh on. So we were, we more or less just sort of treaded water and spent time in Peru. And I think that uh, Herman Knudsen, who worked for John Eklund, who was the mm-hmm. um, primarily the Latin American coordinator, I think he probably went back to Peru later and maybe helped to identify some of the people that came. And uh, Chile was not as, uh, as as warm and open a reception as we got from Venezuela, but, mm-hmm. but we did have some Chileans uh, that also came here on the program. They, uh, the Chileans, uh, many of them were uh, were more almost of European extraction mm-hmm. because of the the uh, immigration there during World yeah. War II and that sort of thing. Yeah. Venezuelans were the real real guts of the the campesina movement mm-hmm. that came here. Were they playing a lot of baseball in Venezuela when no, you were there? No, they may have Johan been. Santana, yeah. the twins <laughs> pictures from Venezuela. I was not. I was not really aware of that okay. either. Um, we were just so concentrated in terms of what we were doing mm-hmm. that. Uh, mm-hmm. And of course, not being able to really read the local newspapers, didn't find any English language newspapers, and so. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, it was. Uh, mm-hmm. We kind of cut off for a while. Yep. Yep. Um, getting back to South Dakota, with um, you dealt with uh, several different people who were involved in farmers' union leadership. You mentioned Jim Patton from the national level. Uh, I think he retired in 1966, so you mm-hmm. probably... Did he come to South Dakota a lot in those days? I would think yes. Uh, I think he came for several state conventions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, that was pretty much standard mm-hmm, for the mm-hmm, national president right, to speak right. at state conventions, mm-hmm, and still mm-hmm, is. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jim Patton was very much an internationalist, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, with the uh, World Food Organizations and yeah. the United Nations and so forth, and... Uh, but yeah, he did. He did come, I think, for for the state conventions, and of course, we would see him at national meets and so forth. He mm-hmm. tremendous influence, just a tremendous influence. What a what a uh, giant giant of a man. Yeah, I got. I have a, mm-hmm. one of the few pictures I have of uh, me with anybody. I've got one of mm-hmm. with Patton uh, from mm-hmm. the early '80s convention before he passed mm-hmm. away when we were out mm-hmm. to California. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I first started working for Farmers Union, Harold Goldsell. Yes, and that's president. the next name on my list. Yeah, good, and you want to good. talk about Harold oh, a little bit? Yeah, Der- 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 Harold was also a, a very committed From uh, Kingsbury person. County. Kingsbury Co- County, right. He was a graduate of Gustavus Adolphus University in Minnesota. Oh, okay. And never let you forget it. Gustavus <laughs> Adolphus was, was talked about a great deal. Um, a, uh, uh, a real people person. 
a real people person. He just cared deeply about people and, and uh, uh, you know, truly about Farmers Union. Uh, he mm -hmm. just, we lost him far too soon. I think, was he 49 years old when he had mm -hmm. a heart attack? Died wow. just, just suddenly. Uh, yep. And it was right shortly after um, Kennedy's uh, inauguration because he had gone to Pierre mm -hmm. uh, and had attended a, a group of some sort, some kind of a, of a get together where they listened to the inauguration speech together. Oh, okay. And uh, was so, you know, was so enamored of that. Although he made it very clear he was a Republican, mm -hmm. he was very supportive mm -hmm. of Kennedy. He had served in the state legislature, I believe, as a Republican from Kingsbury County. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just a few days after that that uh, I'd never even known that he had any heart problems, and he yeah. he, he died. But uh, <laughs> very very influential person, very soft-spoken, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. not your great vice president for some time before he was president, I understand. That could be. I, yep. uh, uh, yep. That predates my direct uh, association there, and so, and then of course Ben Radcliffe was his vice president, mm -hmm. and then Ben moved into the presidency when Harold passed away. Yeah, and uh, you worked with Ben quite mm -hmm. a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally, totally different kind of uh, of, uh, of, of uh, direction. Harold, I think, was always a little bit reluctant uh, to, and maybe because because of his political affiliation, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, bring Farmers Union too much into the the, the political arena. Uh -huh. And Ben mm -hmm. was at was in the legislature mm -hmm. as a Democratic. Uh, uh, I think he was in the House of Representatives. I'm not yes. sure he might have been in the Senate. That's right. At that time, and so there was a there was more of a natural kind of, of uh, political influence mm -hmm. came along with Ben when he mm -hmm. came into, into the presidency. Although I think Farmers Union always we always worked very very hard at trying to be bipartisan, mm -hmm. as as is still you know the the emphasis. Yeah. But you know, let's face it, the Democrats do do better for mm -hmm. farmers than the Repu mm -hmm. Republicans traditionally do. So uh, that's just that's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Did did you? Uh have any con connections with some of the other past leadership, people like Paul Opsel? Who oh, were... Paul's a close personal family friend mm -hmm. uh, from Aberdeen. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, right. Yeah, he, uh, he and my dad had worked together in Farmers Union for many years. Oh, so, yes, okay. Paul was Paul was very much a uh, a close close friend and someone I looked up to and, and mm -hmm. respected a great deal. Yeah, I think Ben used to refer to him as the old war horse that Farmers could be. Union. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and Paul's son, Paul Marvin Opsal, mm -hmm. was uh, uh, a peer, a contemporary of mine. So we went to camps together and so forth. And mm -hmm. Paul is a Paul is still in South Dakota. He's a, a Methodist, I believe, or Presbyterian pastor. Mm -hmm. And not mm -hmm. so sure he isn't in the Yankton area. And I have yeah, seen him. I think at, that's true. Saw him, I think, last year at the McGovern Day dinner in Yankton. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was that's a, uh, a nice memory. Mm -hmm. And of course, Tony Deschamps, who yep. became the national president, was was a became a close personal friend of mine when I was working for the government, and living in Washington D.C. We would we would converse occasionally. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Tony was still president when yeah. I started. So. Yeah, Tony paid me, I think, one of my supreme compliments one time on a personal level. He said he thought I was a gut level liberal, <laughs> and I consider that a real compliment. <laughs> he said my reactions to things come from my gut. Uh huh. And, uh, Tony, you know, Tony always, of course, spoke at the state convention mm -hmm. when I started, and mm -hmm. uh, he occasionally would offend people because he would get wound up and he would use some language they didn't <laughs> want to hear at the state convention. I could be. I, I, that I was not aware of. But, uh, yeah, he's, uh, yeah, he was the happy warrior kind of like. He always... Uh, Mm -hmm. he, see, he, he seemed very much a national leader type mm -hmm. person to me. Mm -hmm. I was very impressed with yes. him. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we, we could, might mention a politician or two. You couldn't have missed George McGovern oh, in those days. No, right. Interestingly enough, when I was at, when, when, when my husband and I were at the uh, McGovern Day event in, uh, in Yankton a year ago, mm -hmm. he was, um, uh, he had his books. Yeah. And the Essential America is the mm -hmm. most recent one. And we wanted him to autograph it. And um, when we got, got, through the, got up to him on the line, he looked up at me and he said, well, hello, he said, uh, you know, he said, I spoke at the Montana Farmers Union Convention uh, this last year, which means that he remembered me from 
those 40 some mm -hmm. years or whatever as being a farmers union connection yeah, yeah. oh yes yes he was uh, a very much an important part of the, the farmers union years right mm -hmm. and he still is just uh, one of my heroes Mm -hmm. yeah, real heroes. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, of course, uh, there was always Carl Munt. And, uh... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he would, uh, I'm not even sure how many times he, he would even, I think he had came occasionally to a state convention, mm -hmm. but it was not, uh, mm -hmm. uh, was not very often. Did they do the uh, debates back in the 60s? They would bring in the candidates. Uh, when I started, that was about the only time that there would be a statewide debate between the candidates for Senate, for example. And today anymore, there are more debates than people are interested in, I think. I think we would have them on the program, but I don't know that it was ever billed as a debate. Yeah, we used to call it a political panel. That's right, that's right. And get people mm -hmm. like Leo Hardig, who was the anchor man at Kello, who mm -hmm. would moderate it. I think we did some of that, but that's yeah. not something that, that you, really jumps not out. Not something that the, you were so busy doing the youth program, <laughs> you didn't so, have right. time for that right. stuff. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one other thing that we didn't talk a lot about, uh, d during the time you were uh, state education director, they would have purchased the, the, the uh, oh, All-States sure, Camp at sure. Bailey, right, so if exactly. you want to talk about that oh, a little bit. Well, what a, uh, what a delightful thing that was. We went, I went several years to All-States Camp at uh, uh, Red Rocks Camp mm -hmm. in Golden, Colorado, mm -hmm. yep. which was a, a real old site. And then uh, came the time that, that there was a decision to build. I've forgotten. Did we build it or or just or buy it? I mean, did well, we get the bought, and then like, bought the site and then yeah. built the building? Right. Yeah. Okay. Some of the buildings were some of the buildings already there. I'm Could not be, sure. But the big A shaped building yes. was the one that the one that we built, yeah. and and we raised money for it. And yeah. Uh, um, yeah, the first year first year that we took campers out there was a pretty exciting time. And, mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. Had our own national campsite. We kept talking in South Dakota about about wanting to have a campsite. You know, Montana did and so forth. But the usage of it would be so yeah. so rare, and and then renting it out to other mm -hmm. groups is a management kind of responsibility. Yeah. And you have to have and, full time employees that's right, to run that's the right. thing. And just never got to that site. There are there are really good campsites available in South Dakota for rent and for lease. And mm -hmm. So the church camps are wonderful. Oh yes, right? absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. But what an experience that is for young people that going to camp. It's that for many the first time ever away from mom and dad for any period of time and there's some homesickness to deal mm -hmm. with and so forth and it's uh, I worked for National Farmers Union one summer the first summer out of, out of college uh, on their summer camp staff okay and um, I did uh, that was my first time I ever rode an airplane I mm -hmm. my, my folks took me to um, Wisconsin to their campsite they own one Camp Kenwood yes I think they still do yes they do a beautiful mm -hmm. campsite and uh, First is that I, wrong where the... Uh, it's at uh, Eau Claire. Eau Claire, uh, yeah. okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Chippewa, Chippewa, Chippewa Falls is where Chippewa the state Falls. office is at. Over there. And that's where, where, yeah, and that's where the uh, campsite is too, just out of Chippewa Falls a little ways, Camp Kenley. Mm -hmm. um, first night we were there with campers, a tornado struck. <sighs> and um, it, was, it was really quite an experience keeping the, uh, keeping the kids, you know, uh, active and busy. Lights went out and so forth. And, nothing to cook breakfast with the next morning and remember one camper one little camper wrote home to their parents we found out later we had popcorn for breakfast <laughs> 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 you know? anyway i flew from uh from uh, uh eau claire into minneapolis and then from there to denver uh for the rest of to to embark on the rest of my summer activities which included camps in illinois and indiana and then all states camp and so forth so it was an okay. interesting experience okay uh, you resigned, uh, what, from the, your Farmers Union job when, in 1965? 1966. Let me mention one okay. more thing before I go on. Okay. This oldest sister that I mentioned that um, uh, uh, had gone, you know, was a teacher, mm -hmm. also worked for South Dakota Farmers Union. Oh, really? Um, as a field worker, and that must have been in the mid-40s. Oh, okay. And, What's uh, her name? Uh, Elvira Schley. Okay. And um, she worked, I remember she worked with Amo Lorix and uh, some of the, the folks that were, okay. were active at that time. Yeah, so we didn't was, talk about Emil, but he was no, still active no, in the 50s yeah. and what 60s. A, what a joy also. He's a, just a delightful person. Anyway, yes, I uh, 
after uh, eight years, 1959 to 1965 into 66, I decided that if I were going to experience any of the things that I was teaching, mm -hmm. you know, the civil rights thing sure. and, and the United Nations thing and so forth, I was going to have to spread my wings a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I loved what I was doing. But uh, an older, uh, a sister-in-law of mine worked for the federal government and she said, Arlene, have you ever considered going to work for the government? And I said, mm -hmm. no. And she said, well, you should. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, there was a federal service entrance exam for college graduates. Yep. And then if you pass that, there was an additional option called the Management Intern Program. Mm -hmm. And so I took the federal service entrance exam in Huron and passed that. And then the uh, uh, Management Intern Option test was only given. And it was a group test, mm -hmm. four of us, mm -hmm. and it was a very intensive sort of thing in Sioux Falls. So I went and took that and passed that. And um, I was 29 years old at the time, and usually those were given like to recent college graduates. And uh, so once you once you get once I got a uh, uh, a notice of being eligible to be hired as a management intern, mm -hmm. then the federal agencies start contacting you and recruiting yeah. you. And being a woman was an advantage at that time, mm -hmm. and because they were starting to to look at how their their diversity program was mm -hmm. going. And uh, I went to. Uh, went to Washington to interview, and stayed with John Holo and okay. his wife, because uh, John had obviously one of your predecessors, mm -hmm. and we were very close yeah. friends. And uh, John's dad, Ken, um, was the Assistant Secretary of Interior for Water and Power at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. I remember John lined up an interview for me at the Department of Interior, and the day I went, Ken was uh, acting secretary, Udall, Secretary Udall was gone for the day. Oh, okay. And so they ushered me into <laughs> Ken's <laughs> office. And Bob Nelson, another predecessor mm -hmm. of yours, was yeah. always working for him as a PR yeah. director. And uh, we sat there and visited for an hour, and I was not aware of what you know what an event this really was to to mm -hmm. be spending an hour in the office of the Secretary of Interior. And his secretary would come in with notices, and he'd just say, "Put it aside." And so we visited. Then I interviewed for quite a, for with several people at Interior, and. Um, and I finally settled on General Services Administration, and one reason was that there was a position open in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. wasn't quite as far from home to start with. Yeah. And uh, and I was going into you know management training, mm -hmm. and my career uh, started out then in the personnel field, okay. human relations personnel field. Yeah. yeah. And I be I I I really had a a fast moving career. I. I was in Kansas City for about three and a half years, moved to Washington, D.C. for a promotion, went from there to Chicago as a personnel director in that region for mm -hmm. a promotion, back to Washington as a staff position, uh, then to Kansas City as um, the second in mm -hmm. charge of that region, and then uh, a politically management directed move took me back to Washington. It wasn't politically in terms of my politics because I stuffed them in a closet for several years. <laughs> but uh, a new um, uh, uh, administrator of GSA who was just trying to show how powerful he was and he moved about, just did a fruit basket upset with about 30 of us. And I, so I was in Washington for about a year mm -hmm. and then I left GSA and went to work for the Department of Commerce and went back to Kansas City. Mm -hmm and was there for four years, and then I went back to GSA into the number two slot in Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. 1,500 employees, and I was there for seven years. Okay, I think you were there when you were, the time you were up to the reunion camp we yes, had at right. mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. in the early 90s. So this spanned 66 to um, uh, 95. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in 95 I retired and uh, came back to South Dakota. Yeah, and you probably viewed that personnel kind of situation as, a, as an opportunity to, uh, uh, to yes. <laughs> use your, your civil right. rights uh, Oh yes, very commitment. much so. I, uh, I had the first black secretary in the personnel department in uh, uh, Kansas City mm -hmm. and uh, you know, was, that was at the time that Martin Luther King was killed and, and she lived in a neighborhood that was very much in an uproar, and so she couldn't mm -hmm. come to work for two or three days to take care of her family, and yeah. so yeah, there were some interesting experiences there also. Yeah, yeah I uh, I was a little bit on the cutting edge through through a lot of that stuff, and then I, I managed to uh, go back to uh, uh, school on a part time basis and earn my master's of business administration, and then that 
helped to put me in line to move up into a controller position mm -hmm. and a director of administration. So that personnel became part of my, uh, one of my uh, subordinate organizations. And uh, mm -hmm. we got, I, I ended up uh, the last three years, I was a member of the senior executive service in the federal government. Okay. Which is, um, you know, the highest ranking uh, uh, grades in the, in the uh, civilian, uh, mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. the, in the career service. Yeah. I, uh, I, can, I was always working for political uh, managers, mm -hmm. politically mm -hmm. appointed managers, but I was usually, yeah. uh, for several years, I was the highest ranking career uh, okay. civil service. And you've kind of settled back into Aberdeen oh, here now? yeah. Right. Yeah. right. You've been here the entire ten years mm -hmm. since you retired. From and had I never married until four years ago. Yeah. And had the wonderful experience of getting reconnected with a college sweetheart. Oh, really? Who okay. lived in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. And at the times I was in Washington, I didn't know he was there. And uh, mm -hmm. so this was home for him too. Though. Yeah, he graduated from Central High School. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, we spent our first year or two at Northern together, and then. He moved away, and then I graduated, moved away, and we completely lost track of each other. And uh, now I have become the the proud stepmother of five sons and mm -hmm. and uh, ten grandchildren. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, been it been a very very nice mm -hmm. move. And I came back here. Uh, had I been living in Kansas City when I retired, I may have stayed there because mm -hmm. I liked. Yeah. city. I'm not a Texan. Mm -hmm. Fort Worth, Texas, Texas didn't set real well with me. Yeah. And um, so I decided I wasn't going to retire there. And if you're going to move, I had I have two sisters and a brother and their families living here in Aberdeen yet. Okay. Marvelous situation. I'm the youngest of five and we're mm -hmm. all we're all surviving. One mm -hmm. brother is in Mesa, Arizona, and we just moved mm -hmm. to see him a weekend ago, a week ago for the weekend. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, this was the logical place to come home to. You can fly out of mm -hmm. here and travel as much as you want to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you didn't feel the urge to go to move to some retirement area like Absolutely Arizona not. or something. No. 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 Yeah. No. Yeah. Ultimately, I think these areas may be more affordable for people retiring than some of those spots. Could well uh, be. Yeah. yeah. No, my I have a brother who lives in Mesa, and he wouldn't come back here. He doesn't like the cold weather, so he's he has retired there. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I I I guess the family ties here are really good. Yeah. And Wes is fortunate also that his mother lived in Winona, Minnesota, and we've moved her to Aberdeen. Okay. And she has a sister in Ipswich, so he has cousins and so forth. So we both oh, have family ties here that are very strong. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Um. I guess I'm I'm almost ready to wrap up, uh, um, and I and I guess maybe it would stand a reason. I've been you know I've been working for Farmers Union since my thirty first year, mm -hmm. uh, and and I'm also a member of the Optimus Club. And maybe you have to be to to to, to plug away at this at these right. kind of issues for this long. But how do you how optimistic are you about the future? You as you look out here at rural America and. Uh, and South Dakota and uh, and the whole kind of international and national situation that we're in these days. Are you uh, are you optimistic or a little pessimistic or somewhere in the middle, and, or do you fluctuate back and forth? Uh, well, um, I guess you have to take that in chunks. Yeah. Uh, Bert Elliott, uh, not a rel not a relative. He is it? All. Okay. No, no. Uh, but Bert <laughs> is in the state that. legislature. Yep. Very. Uh, Highly respected teacher in Aberdeen. Uh, it yep. serves on the uh, uh, credit union board with me. Okay. The Aberdeen Federal Credit Union. And he told me that um, Brown County has lost 75% of its high school students in the last 20 years. And I couldn't believe that. I said, you must mean there's only 75% as many. You know, he said, no, lost 75% in the county. I think we're down to, what, only two or three high schools in Brown County besides Aberdeen. Um, I just don't see any way of reversing that trend. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Fought a long time for it when I, in my yep. Farmers Union days, and I think, I, I'm not sure that, it, that uh, it will change a great deal more in the future. I think mm -hmm. that probably the farms may have reached pretty much an optimum size yep. right now. We were very fortunate when my brother sold the family farm that, that mm -hmm. Dad had homesteaded. 
uh, that Grandpa had homesteaded. Then he was able to sell it to one of the, the neighbors, yeah. a young man who had uh, who'd gone to uh, State University at Brookings and mm-hmm. had come back to farm. And so uh, his dad and he bought, bought the farm. And so we were able to keep that in the family. Now, two years ago, he was unfortunately killed in a paraplane accident right on the farmyard. Mm-hmm. And I'm afraid his, his, his widow and the children are too young to take over, and I don't know what's going to happen to that, whether it will still stay in a family agricultural setting or not. But um, it looks to me like, like, you know, except for the farmers who are selling now to out-of-state recreational mm-hmm. uh, uh, units who are coming in just to set up pheasant farms yeah. and so forth, that maybe that population decline in the rural areas may have, may have halted here. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and I, I think that, that you know, the way of life is, is just so incredibly good that, uh, yeah. that people will, will stay here for those reasons. Uh, nationally, I'm, I'm very concerned right now about the, uh, uh, the judicial um, nomination situation and the filibuster, um, the uh, possible just change of the whole way the Senate does business is really scary. And I think the grab for power on the part of the majority right now is just unconscionable. Uh, and it, it makes me very frightened. But I, I guess I'm optimistic enough to know that, to think that what goes around comes around. Mm-hmm. And I think it's going to go just far enough that we will see some major changes perhaps in the next congressional election. And the, I think the two-party system is absolutely essential for our way of life. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the majority party to abuse it is is uh, yeah yeah I is, heard is, this uh, morning on public radio I heard uh, one of the conservative activists referring to this as what he, he said this would be uh, that the Democratic Party would be like a pet that has been neutered and they wouldn't have to yeah, worry and just yeah. you know be out of yeah. the picture yeah. and that's kind of scary that yeah, kind of it, attitude uh, that people would actually be willing to voice that on national right. radio I uh, I I. I love the internet. <laughs> yeah. I was reading the Washington Post this morning on mm-hmm. the internet, mm-hmm. and they talked about the, one columnist talked about the fact that if this uh, if the change goes to um, um, uh, voting on judges the way they they want it to go, that it probably would would eliminate the last bit of comity which still exists in the Senate, which is very very low at this point. That it would become just a just a constant battleground. I just you know uh, I have wondered many times at why someone of the talent and and um, knowledge and wisdom and skill of a Stephanie Herseth would even want to subject herself to an election and then to serving in, in this kind of uh, of a setting. Uh, fortunately, she has she's such a bright star on the horizon. And when someone like Stephanie can be elected and and uh, you know, uh, continue to grow her base. I think it's mm-hmm. wonderful. I'm also encouraged by the fact that Montana and Wyoming have Democratic governors. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's just wonderful. It means that the two-party system is still working in, in some of these parts of the country. Internationally, I'm I'm more worried. I guess more pessimistic, and I don't know what that means in terms of what the outcome is. Mm-hmm. I guess that that uh, hopefully heads will prevail. I'm, I'm a real believer in the United Nations and all the criticisms of it just really hurt. I was uh, Secretary of the State AAUN Association, mm-hmm. American Association of the United Nations yeah. when I was in here on the farm. Yeah, when I, when back in the 70s we were still having a United Nations lunch at yes, the conventions. Right, right. And, uh, then that kind of drifted away in yeah. the 80s. We didn't yeah. do that anymore. It might be well to consider restarting it. I just yeah. think that those kinds of things are important. Um, I. Uh, I think that the damage that's been done around the world uh, by the bully pulpit, mm-hmm. the bully activities of, of our government are, are frightening. I, uh, I, I believe that when this president uh, was elected, he had never traveled internationally. Yeah. If he had, it was very rarely. I've traveled internationally a great deal. I, mm-hmm. have, uh, I have been to the Soviet Union and to Israel and to, of course, Germany and England and, and uh, Spain and Portugal and Morocco and and and, and just have mm-hmm. developed it and I, I, most of them have been musical trips and so mm-hmm. we've shared the musical kinds oh, of things okay. and, mm-hmm. and been to operas and yeah. symphonies around the world and and uh, uh, have a great deal of respect mm-hmm. for our for our for our rural community and our fellow citizens and yeah. and to think that that I may be looked upon with disdain in some circles if I travel uh, again. 
just because of what's happened with uh, with uh, Iraq and our, mm -hmm. our bullying sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, that um, that 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 to me is a very great danger. But um, I guess hope springs eternal, and um, and I just think that there's enough people of goodwill. And I love listening to Ed Schultz on the radio, mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, uh, find that there are people who are willing to speak out on behalf of the minority at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I do the same. I proudly proclaim myself a liberal, and uh, mm -hmm. I think that we need to need to do those kinds of things. And so I guess that uh, I will continue to do whatever it is I can, which mm -hmm. is in a small mm -hmm. area, I guess, but uh, to um, to bring about some mm -hmm. some respect for other people yeah. and uh, the greatest good for the greatest number mm -hmm. in my own way. And I think if we all just do a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah, and things like being to, involved in your credit union yeah, here and, yeah. uh, and, and the, the church. Yeah, church. I, uh, I just, Which church is that? It's a Lutheran church, Lutheran church. Uh, sure. a Good Shepherd Lutheran mm -hmm. Church. And I, I just want to be among those who say I too am a member of faith. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and uh, I have my my moral values and mm -hmm. faith values, and uh, uh, they fit well with my political uh, outlook yeah. also, and I don't take a second seat to anybody on that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think as long as there are people of, like us who are willing to speak out and do those kinds of things, that, that we do have some hope. Yeah. Fortunately, I married a man of uh, similar uh, beliefs to myself. So okay. <laughs> after waiting 64 years and getting married for the first time, I, uh, I was able to, to put that together. All right. Well, uh, do you have anything you would like to add at this point? I'm out of questions. <laughs> no, I think that I have uh, pretty much uh, tapped, mm -hmm. haven't exhausted, but certainly tapped the, uh, the, the things that I felt important to talk about. So. Okay. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome.